Hello, my name is Satya. Today I'm going to discuss about our paper on new constructions of hinting values, one-way functions with encryption, and more. This is a joint work with Bishop Goel and Brent Waters. Let's start with a brief history. In 2017, Chu and others introduced this concept called laconic oblivious transfer to make oblivious transfer more communication efficient. They used really cool techniques in this paper to construct laconic OT. Later on, Dotting and Gerg abstracted out these techniques into a beautiful primitive called Caminion Hash with encryption. Later on, this primitive and its variants found tons of applications like identity based encryption, registration based encryption, trapped of functions, designated verifier zero knowledge, CPR to CC transformation, trapped of hash functions, and so on. And that's a ton of applications. As it turns out, all these applications can be constructed based on a very few related primitives like one way function with encryption, hash with encryption, signatures with encryption, and so on. These primitives are syntactically pretty similar, and some of these primitives are even known to imply each other. Now we may ask, why are these primitives so powerful that they have so many applications? The reason is they have a witness encryption flavor to it. We know witness encryption is quite powerful, so even these primitives are powerful. Since these primitives are so powerful, we certainly need more efficient constructions to build these primitives. And that's precisely what we do in this paper. In this paper, we concentrate on two primitives, one way function with encryption and hinting piages. Even though we concentrate only on these primitives, we believe our techniques will be helpful to construct even the other primitives as well. I would also like to mention that there are other papers that also work towards improving efficiency of this framework. For example, Gurgen Hajibadi proved that one way function with encryption implies trapped of functions. And later on, three more papers work towards improving efficiency of trapped of functions. In particular, these works try to improve uh, the public key size of the trapped of functions and the output size of the trapped of functions. As I mentioned earlier, even we work towards improving efficiency of this one way function with encryption, our efficiency improvements lead to trapped of functions with shorter public keys. And that's it regarding the history part. Now let's see what one way function with encryption actually is. As the title says, there is a one way function component to it. So there is a function f that takes input x and outputs a value y. And there is an encryption component as well. So there is an encryptor that encrypts a message and there's a decryptor that encrypts a ciphertext. But what are keys to these algorithms? The keys actually come from the one way function. Here y acts as the encryption key and x acts as the decryption key. The correctness says that if x is a pre image of y, then the decryption works. Well, that looks pretty similar to public encryption. To make it something different, the encryption algorithm also takes an index i and a bit b as input. And now the decryption algorithm works if x is a pre image of y and if pi to the bit of x is equal to b. So not every pre image of y works, only a specific pre images of y work. For the security part, f has to be one way and two, f has to be smooth, which means if x is a sample from a uniform distribution, then the corresponding y should also resemble uniform distribution. For the security of encryption, if the adversary has a value x, and if the ciphertext is encrypted with respect to image of x, which is y, and if the encryption is with respect to opposite bit of x, in that case, the ciphertext should look uniform to the adversary. It essentially states that if the adversary doesn't have the right decryption key, then the ciphertext should look uniform. And now let me discuss about a cool construction of this primitive based on DDH assumption. This construction is given by Dotting and Gerg. In this construction, the public parameters would consist of a group generator G and M2N group elements, 2N group generators, arranged as in the form of a matrix. Here N represents the input length of the one-way function. Suppose we have an input X. To compute the one-way function, from each column of the matrix, we pick one generator. How do we pick it? We, from the jth column, we pick the generator that corresponds to the jth bit of x. So that's going to be gjxj. And now we are going to take product of all these generators to compute the value of y. And now let's see how to encrypt a message. Here the encryption key is the image y. And we encrypt the message with respect to index i, bit b, and randomness row. To encrypt the message, you raise every generator in the public, public parameters with the randomness row. 
and then you go out all these entries as part of the ciphertext except for i comma one minus bth element so you have two n minus one of these entries as part of ciphertext and then you also give out y power row times m as part of ciphertext and now let's see how to decrypt the ciphertext here the decryption key is the premage of premage x such that xi equals to b the decryptor would pick a generator from each column of the ciphertext depending upon the bits of x as and multiply all these generators and since x is a premage of y what you get is going to be y power row and since given y power row you can easily update the message given uh, y power row times m and suppose x is premage of y but ith bit of x is equal to 1 minus b what happens then in that case, the decryptor can't multiply all the generators in the ciphertext because one block is missing. And that's the basis for security. The security proof crucially depends on the fact that the ciphertext is missing in this block. As it turns out, the, how the, the constructions of many other related primitives also proceed in a very similar fashion. Even their security proofs rely on the fact that the, secure, the ciphertext is missing in a block. And that's what we call missing block framework. Recall this picture from a few slides ago. We had tons of applications from the literature and all these applications are relying on a very few related primitives. As it turns out, the constructions of all these primitives all rely on missing block framework. So the technique is quite powerful, but there's a problem with it. Because of this technique, the ciphertext became quite long. That also means if we use this one-way functional encryption to construct tabdo functions, the resulting tabdo functions would have a long public key. And now I guess it's better to look for other frameworks and techniques to build these primitives, and that's exactly what we do in this work. We develop our new primitives, uh, and we develop some new techniques to build one-way function with encryption. And we also show that our techniques uh, are helpful in having a better constructions for hinting PIGs as well. And now let's compare the efficiency of our techniques with that of missing block framework. Here are the time complexities of DDH construction. Moving on to our construction, our first construction is based on factoring assumption. And as you know, we want to deviate from this missing block framework because this framework is giving out long ciphertext size. And that's precisely what we optimize. The rest of the complexities remaining same are encryption algorithm and ciphertext size are exponentially better than DDH construction. And, but since we are relying on factoring assumption, our group sizes are bigger. So there is some trade off here. We also extend the same techniques to pairing based groups with, with DBDH assumption, which is some pairing based assumption. We also optimize encryption time and ciphertext size. But this time, the time complexities of the other algorithms are actually higher. So there is some trade off here as well. We also have to have a construction without pairings but the efficiency is slightly weaker than that of pairings construction so i'm not discussing here and there's no clear winner it all depends upon what you want to optimize all right so let's finally move on to the construction part for the rest of the talk we'll see how to construct one-way function with encryption based on the assumption called factoring the assumption states that given product of two large primes you can't easily factor it In this construction, the public parameters would consist of an RSA modulus n, which is a product of two large primes. It also consists of a group generator uh, g from uh, for the group z n star. So basically, here we are dealing with uh, the group z n star, and n acts as a group description, and g acts as the group generator. And now the public parameters also consists of two one random large primes arranged as a matrix. Here n again represents the input length of the one-way function. And remember earlier we had two and random generators in the DDH construction. Here we're having two and random large primes instead. And that's the difference. If you want to compute the one-way function of input X, and then from each column of the matrix, we're going to pick one element, depending upon the bits of X, and we're going to multiply those. So that's going to be product of EJXJ. With an exponential G with this exponent. And that's going to be output value Y. Remember, we earlier had to multiply a few generators in the DDH construction. Here, we're going to multiply a few exponents instead. So that's a difference here. 
And suppose you want to encrypt MSS M with respect to key K, with respect to key Y, uh, index I, a bit B, and randomness row. This architecture looks something like this. Remember earlier in the DDH construction, we exponentiate each generator in the public parameters with randomness row, and we go to 2n minus 1 elements. We miss one block there. Here, it's exactly the opposite. We only give out I comma beat entry and miss out the rest of the blocks. And that's where our efficiency kicks in. Here, our ciphertext contains only two elements. And our encryption time is also much lesser. For the decryption, we get the prematch x such that uh, xi equals to b. And the decryptor exponentiates the ciphertext with these bunch of ejxj values, just like when evaluating the one-way function. But the decryptor is going to ignore the i comma b entry because that's already part of uh, the ciphertext. Clearly, this is going to be equal to one y power row. And given y power row, you can decrypt the ciphertext, uh, decrypt the message, uh, given y power row times n. And now let's move on to the security part. As we know, we got to prove three security properties, one winners, smoothness, and security of encryption. Let's proceed with one winners first. Suppose the adversary gets public parameters and some image y. We need to prove that the adversary will not be able to compute any inverse of y. What we prove is if the adversary can compute inverse of y, then it can also break RS assumption. Let's prove it. Suppose y is sampled by first sampling x and setting y equals to f of x. And now let's say the adversary returns some value z such that f of z equals to y. We set up parameters in such a way that each image y has a lot of inverses. So with high probability, z is not, not going to be equal to x. Let's say i bit of x is not equal to i bit of z. Given that both f of x and f of z is equal to y, we have this equation here. By moving EIZI to the opposite side, we have the second equation. And now we use something called Shami's trick. I'm not going to the details of the trick. All you need to know is that by using this trick, when we have an equation of the second kind, you can compute g power 1 over EIZI from it. And that means we can solve RSA challenge for generator g and prime EIZI. So we are, so the adversary is breaking the one minus property. He can also have break RS assumption. And now let's move on to the security of encryption part. This property says that if the adversary does not have the right decryption key, then the ciphertext looks random. Here's the structure of a ciphertext. We know that from RS assumption, given a generator H and some exponent E, computing H over one by E is hard. And that's what RS assumption states. If we apply the same assumption with h equals to z power rho times eib and e equals to eib, then RS assumption states that computing g power rho is hard. Suppose we assume a slightly stronger assumption called phi heading assumption. We can prove that not just computing g power rho is hard, g power rho also has high entropy. If g power rho has high entropy, then certainly y power rho also has high entropy. And that means the second part of the ciphertext looks random. And that's our security proof. And now let's move on to the smoothness property. The property says that if X is sampled from uniform distribution, then resulting Y also resembles uniform distribution. For these types of functions, general in cryptography, we prove this property by proving first that the function is too universal and then invoke lift over hash lemma that implies the function is smooth. Unfortunately, this kind of proof doesn't work here. Well, why doesn't a traditional proof work here? It's because a good old statement says something like this. Product of ejj mod t, this function is too universal if one t is prime and if ejj values are sampled uniform mod t. Let's if this statement is true here. Here we have product of ejxj modulus phi of n, that is the order of the exponent. So the modulus phi of n is certainly not prime here. The first condition is not satisfied. And none, we are sampling ejxj values as random large primes. And the primes are not certainly uniform mod t, 
So even the second condition failed. So we have two issues with the proof. Let's see how to solve both the issues one by one. The first issue is we are dealing with a modulus t equals to phi fn, which is a composite number. Since we want a prime modulus, let's prime factors t into r1, r2, and so on to rk. So here, each of these ra values is a prime number. And then let's break the original function into k components. Product mod r1, product mod r2, and so on to product mod rk. Obviously, you can combine these k components into the back into the original function by using Chinese Yamada theorem. So these k components are just a different way of representing the original function. If you can prove each of these k functions is smooth, then obviously the original function is smooth. Since uh, each of the for each of these functions r a value is uh, is a prime number, so for each of these functions the first condition is satisfied. So the first issue is solved. And now let's move on to the second issue. The second issue is e j x j values are not sampled uniformly; they are random primes. You know, primes have a bizarre distribution. We can't really improve much about primes. So what to do? Fortunately for us, we have a cool theorem down here, which says that if you sample a large primes and take it modulo r, you will get a distribution which is close to ZR star. And once you have this theorem, our both conditions are satisfied. We know the modulus is prime and the e j x j values are also close to uniform. So that's cool. This beautiful theorem down here is called a prime number theorem for arithmetic proportions. It's proved way back in 1800s and it's famous in math literature. To the best of our knowledge, something like this has not been used in crypto before. I also have to note that this theorem works only if the modulus r is actually large. So we have to deal with uh, the functions with small modulus somewhat differently. And that's what we are going to do now. Let's break a proof into two cases. One first case when modulus r is large, and the second case where modulus r is small. In the first case, the prime number theorem applies, and e j x j values are close to uniformly random over mod t. And uh, since so you can prove this function mod r is close to two universal. Actually, we were able to prove something slightly different. We proved that this modified function is close to two universal, and now we can apply leftover hash lemma. And prove that this function is smooth. In the second case, the value r is small, which means that this entire function value, is, which is at most r, is also going to be small. We were able to prove that this function value is so small that it does not affect the distribution of y, original value y, by much. When you want to prove something about the distribution of y, this small function value only acts as a small noise in front of the overall distribution of y. For the proof uh, of the first case, we relied on statistical arguments, leftover hash lemma, whereas for the second case, we relied on computation arguments. We used factoring assumption uh, for this proof. Our proof works by combining both this statistical argument and computation arguments very coherently. And now, let's finally move on to uh, one-way function with encryption construction based on pairing assumptions. The idea of the constructions are pretty similar to the factoring based construction. Even in this construction, the public parameters consist of a group generator G and a bunch of these EIB values. Here, N represents, again, the input length of the one-way function. Remember, in the factoring based construction, these EIB values are random primes. That's not the case here these EIB values are actually correlated. In fact, we choose this by sampling alpha, some random value of alpha, and setting these EIB values to be consecutive, just like this. So E10 is going to be alpha plus two, E11 is going to be alpha plus three, and so on. So EIB would be alpha plus two I plus B. And now if we want to evaluate one way function on input X, the function just proceeds the same way, for each column of the matrix, we pick one entry depending upon the bits of x. You multiply these values, so that's e j x j, product of e j x j, and you exponential g with this value. If you expand this function, then you're going to get g power product of alpha plus 2g plus xj. Actually, I want to tell something here. Remember in the factoring based construction, what was the secular assumption there? Given h and e, 
it's hard to compute h over one by u. Since we're using similar techniques here, we also need a similar assumption here. So given h and e, we require that it's hard to compute h over one by u. But that assumption is not true here because these are prime order groups. So what we do is to keep these e values secret so that computing h over one by e might be hard. And that means we don't give out alpha in the public parameters. We don't give any of this matrix entry as part of public parameters. But then how do you compute y? You need alpha to compute y, right? So we include g o power alpha, g power alpha square, and so on up to g power alpha power n as part of public parameters. And now the assumption states that given these public parameters, it's hard to compute g power one over alpha. And given these values, you can expand this polynomial uh, over here, our product of alpha plus 2j plus xj in the exponent of y. And you can compute these, uh, these entries from public parameters. And now let's say how do you encrypt MSS? Let's say you want to encrypt with respect to encryption key y and index i, bit b, and randomness row. The ciphertext format again looks pretty similar to factoring based construction. It's g power rho times eib and y power rho times m. Remember in the missing block framework, we gave two n elements as part of the ciphertext and we, we missed one block over there. Here we do the opposite. We only give out one missing block that and ignore the rest of the blocks. And that's where we get our efficiency. We only have two elements as part of the ciphertext. And now suppose you want to decrypt the ciphertext with the decryption key x. Here x is the preimage of y. The decryption again works pretty similar to the factoring construction. But we have a problem here. The decrypter doesn't know these e j x j values because those are not given part of public key. And so decryptor can't experience it like this. Here we use a pairing trick. The ciphertext instead of consisting of uh, y power rho, it consists of e of uh, the pairing of g and y power rho. And the decryptor works by pairing the first element of the ciphertext with g power product of the e j x j values. And since uh, f of x equals to y, uh, this entry over here, it's equivalent to e of g comma y power rho. And once the decryptor contain, co computes this element, it can easily compute the masses given the second element of the ciphertext. In our paper, we also give a way to solve this problem without pairings, but I'm not going to do those details here. As you can see, the techniques for both factoring construction and pairing construction are pretty similar. It's just that we need to make a few modifications here and there to make it work. And that's all I want to discuss about the constructions. Let's move on to the results part. We implemented our constructions and measured our runtimes. And here's a comparison for 128-bit security. You know, we optimized for encryption time and cipher access. As you can see, whatever parameters we tried to optimize, our constructions work pretty well. The DDH construction time, uh, encryption time is 1.0.14 seconds, whereas for our pairing this construction, it's 0 0.002 seconds. So that's 70 times faster. And the DDH ciphertext size is 32.7 kilobytes, whereas our ciphertext size is 0.67 kilobytes. So that means there's a 50 times improvement. So that's pretty good. The time taken by other algorithms is slightly higher than DDH construction. I agree. So there's a trade-off here. There's a reasonable trade-off. You can choose which construction to use based on whatever the application is. And let me conclude the file. Let me finally conclude the talk. In this talk, we discussed about one-way function with encryption. We saw that previous papers are using missing block framework, and we proposed a framework that is different than a missing block framework. And we had improved efficient. We had we got efficient ciphertext because of this framework. In this paper, we also extended the same techniques for hinting pages as well. And that led to hinting pages with shorter public parameters. We finally evaluated our performance and we believe that the techniques can be extended to other very related primitives as well. It would be cool to have uh, more techniques and frameworks for these. And with that, uh, let me conclude the talk. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk until the end. And here's a reprint version of the paper.